Hey everyone, it's Matt, and today I am going to be talking to you all about the video games that I've been playing since the end of March. Now, some of you, if you've been around my channel for a while, might notice that I have a habit of doing little mini reviews. in any given quarter, and I intended on doing that this year, but as you may have noticed, I only did one for the first quarter. So this video is really more of a catch-up since that last video. I'm going to be talking about every game that I played a decent amount of for the first time since the end of March, and that is a big old pile of 24 games, so I have a lot to talk about tonight. Anyway, I do hope you'll enjoy it, and let's get started. So, the first game I played since March was Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition. And this is my first Xenoblade game. I am generally not a big fan of JRPGs, but I've heard good things about the series over the years, and I decided to give this one a try, because I was kind of in a let's try a JRPG mood. And uh, while I will say that this game I do admire it from what it is. Uh, I played maybe five or six hours of it, and I do intend on going back to it at some point because I was kind of enjoying it, but like most JRPGs, uh, I found it got a little tedious and repetitive, unfortunately. That said, if you are a fan of JRPGs, I do think you would like this one. Uh, it's definitely got a huge open world with lots of stuff to explore, lots of customization, and many, many interlocking gameplay systems, most of which I did not really fully understand, to be honest. They just kind of throw a ton of tutorials and text at you and expect you to memorize it all, but this is really just me nitpicking. Overall, if you want a big open world to explore and kind of a unique battle system, it's not a bad game. Um, instead of You can kind of move around and use different uh, commands or different cooldowns and control multiple people. And it's kind of hard to explain if you've not seen it or played it, but it's definitely a little different than most JRPGs, which I do appreciate. But at the end of the day, still not entirely my thing. But as far as JRPGs go, I think it's pretty decent. And I do want to eventually go back to it. And next, I played a game that I know was very popular around the time of its release. And I know it probably still is to some degree, especially with Halloween having just passed. And that was Resident Evil Village. And I like this game a lot. I haven't played all the Resident Evil games. Uh, the main ones I've played have been 4 and 7 before. Those are the ones I've played all the way through. And really this game is basically just a cross between the two of those in terms of style and gameplay and atmosphere and all that. It's kind of the best of both worlds. It's got a lot of variety to it. And while it's not always particularly scary, it's got some very intense moments. And it does a good job of balancing the action, uh, fast-paced type of gameplay from 4, with the more gritty, gruesome horror aspects of 7. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, this is kind of a direct continuation of the story that started in 7. So if you like that game and you were thinking, 
I wish it had a little more action to it. You might like this. I would definitely recommend it if you enjoyed either 4 or 7 or really any of the Resident Evil games as I imagine. This is just more of the same, but with a bit of a twist to it, which I can't really explain without getting into spoilers, but either way, a very good game. I liked it a lot. So next, I was still in a bit of a JRPG mood and trying to find one that I liked and I'd heard things about a relaxing JRPG called Atelier Ryza Ever Darkness and the Secret Hideout. And I'm going to be honest, um, a big chunk of the reason why I bought this game was I follow a Twitter account named Wario64, and if you were following him for much of this year, you would notice, or notice that this game was apparently somewhat hard to get a physical copy of and the sort of elusiveness of it at least at the time did add to the interest I had in the game so I ended up getting it kind of blindly just hearing it was a good relaxing sharp and let's just say I didn't change my mind on JRPGs either unfortunately but to be honest I don't think I gave it enough of a shot This is kind of a, a very simple JRPG with a very simple turn-based combat system, but also a very seemingly elaborate crafting system, which is interesting if you're into the sort of crafting systems in other games where you uh, kind of hoard ingredients and try and make special items and all that. It's a huge part of this game as far as I can tell. And the artwork and the atmosphere and all that in this game is very kind of cute and relaxed and carefree. It's a big change of pace from the games where the world is ending and there's a giant evil threat. This is kind of more laid back. But, like I said, I don't think it's going to change your mind on JRPGs if you're not into them. But also, like with Xenoblade, I do want to go back to it at some point. I haven't gotten rid of it, so maybe one day I'll give it another try when I'm in the mood for a JRPG again. And next up, I played a game I've been wanting to play for a very long time, several console generations ago, but I never got around to it until now, and that was... If you're not familiar with the Phoenix Wright games, it is a sort of visual novel detective game where you are a lawyer and you have to defend your clients in court and uh, investigate cases and find evidence that you can use to prove their innocence. And while that sounds kind of mundane, there's very much an anime sort of twist to this where sometimes have a bit of a fantasy element to them, which makes things particularly entertaining and fun. Uh, I will say that as part of the gameplay, they have you trying to put two and two together and find, uh, I guess, discrepancies in the testimonies of the plaintiffs and all that, and the witnesses. Um, and sometimes the answers are a bit of a reach, a bit of a stretch, where I feel like they don't make perfectly logical sense. It's very much a video game in that sense, where they really want you to choose the right thing, even if there's kind of a wall in it, where another thing does make sense, but it doesn't want you to choose that. But that's a fairly minor thing for the most part. This here is the uh, trilogy of the first three games kind of remastered for the Switch, and it is the imported Japanese version, if you could not tell. But uh, I've only played most of the first one, I haven't finished it yet, and I haven't tried the other two in this trilogy, but I do like it a lot, just I have to be in the mood for it, but 
Either way, if that sounds like your kind of thing, I would recommend Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney. And next was a game that you may have seen me do a live stream of. It is still up on my channel. And that game is a little game called An Airport for Aliens. This is a game that is just as quirky as the title implies. Uh, it is a pretty small little indie game by a uh, up-and-coming developer. Uh, I believe it was somewhat or maybe entirely independently developed. I'm not sure of the actual process, but that's kind of what it feels like to me. And it is a game where you go around various alien airports talking to stock photos of dogs and completing tasks for them and uh, getting plane tickets to other airports to follow your girlfriend around on a little adventure. And this is a game that is very, very, very high on the novelty value. But in my opinion, in the gameplay department is a bit lacking. Um, one of those games that you buy for the novelty and you have a lot of fun laughing at it for about an hour or two, but once you've kind of seen the extent of the novelty it has to offer, the actual gameplay that remains is unfortunately a little repetitive and consists of just uh, fetch quests and waiting around and stuff like that. Though I suppose in a game with lots of dogs, fetch quests Either way, this isn't a game you buy for the gameplay, it's a game you buy to talk to stock photos of dogs, and there's a lot of very witty and funny banter between you and the dogs, and some very clever and well thought out writing that I do appreciate. I just wish the gameplay was not so tedious, because after you start seeing repeats of the same dogs and lines and items and all that, it's mostly just slowly running across giant barren airports and waiting for the in-game clock to reach your uh, departure time over and over again while talking to the same dogs you've already talked to ten times. But, like I said, if the novelty of it for an hour or two seems like the kind of thing you'd be interested in, I do think you might still enjoy this game. Just don't expect a masterpiece in the gameplay department. That's all. Next up, I played what was or is so far my game of the year, unless something better comes out to change it. And that would be Returnal. Now, this is a game that when I first heard of it, I was like, meh doesn't look too exciting, doesn't look worth the price. I'm not really a fan of roguelikes or even third person shooters that much, but when it came out and I read more about it and I read the good reviews and all that, I was like, you know what, maybe I'll give it a try. So I waited until I could get it, get it on sale and I bought it, and let me tell you, I or so, and uh, I don't know, I don't even know how to describe why I like this game so much, but in a lot of ways, it really scratches the itch that games like Dark Souls and Bloodborne uh, scratch, that one more try, really challenging, high risk, high reward type of gameplay, and it's a very, very difficult game, like you might imagine from that description, but it is very satisfying to progress, and it just feels really good to play. It's super tight, and the controls really well, and every time you die, you instantly know why, and you know it's your fault. Unlike a lot of games that feel more unfair, that would test your patience as a result. And in terms of the exploration, and the atmosphere, and the vibe, and all that, it very much reminds me of Metroid Prime, which is one of my favorite games ever made. And if 
just got a really, really dark, oppressive, immersive atmosphere. That's really cool, especially if you play with headphones and the 3D sound. And the controller effects on the PS5 are incredible. Some of the best I've felt with the variable resistance triggers and the detailed vibrations and all that. If you play it with headphones on and the PS5 controller and all that, it's just super really, really intense, addictive game, in my opinion. The high level of difficulty and the intense uh, nature of the game and the repetitiveness of dying over and over again and having to restart sometimes hours-long runs will turn some people off, but if that does not scare you away, I would recommend giving it a try for sure. Zelda Link's Awakening, and this is, of course, the recent remake for the Switch. This is an older Game Boy game, originally, if I'm not mistaken. And yeah, it's a Game Boy game, so I think I actually had it as a kid. I don't rem remember getting very far in it, though. I remember getting stumped. And I can see why, because uh, as this game, in terms of gameplay, is mostly unchanged from the original, there are many very obtuse puzzles in it, and uh, quests where you have to go places that are not immediately obvious by any stretch of the imagination. And for me, it often felt like it boiled down to just exploring every corner of the map and hitting random objects to see if they do anything. Which is very old school, and some people like that, but for me it felt a little tedious. That said, I've only said negative things about this game so far, but I did like it overall. It is a fun game, especially if you're into the older 2D Zelda games. It's got a good variety of dungeons and tools and items and just things to do. You just explore a lot of interesting dungeons and meet interesting characters and all that. It's just a classic Zelda game. If you played any of the old 2D Zelda games, you really know what you're getting into for the most part. And the graphics in this remake are very cute and colorful and it's just a fun game to play and a nice game to look at. As long as you are tolerant, things in the game where they will 
not hint at at all, or barely hint at in a super vague way, something you have to do to avoid getting hurt in like a boss battle or a fight. And if you don't do it, you get extremely huge damage the first time. It's like trial and error, but the punishment is just way too great for a trial and error type of game, in my opinion. So even if you didn't die, which I usually didn't, it often felt very unfair and overly punishing and it just soured my mood. But it's funny because this is a game uh, where to me it felt like it was equal parts way too easy and way too hard. From one moment to the next it was treating you like a baby and then treating you like a genius. And it just felt really unbalanced in terms of difficulty. It's not a hard game really, I beat it without that much difficulty. system in this game, not the series as a whole, but just this game. It's about solving ring puzzles to line up the enemies so you can do good damage to them. And throughout the game, pretty much every puzzle, to me, felt like it was the easiest thing on the face of the planet, or something you had to be a complete genius to figure out. And I don't know, if you don't get the idea yet, this game I just found really frustrating several occasions, but it's equally frustrating because as a whole, I liked a lot of what the game did. I just feel like if I took a different approach to game design and polished out a lot of the balance issues and the tediousness of it, it could be a much, much better game. It's got the soul of a good game, but the mechanics don't quite that said, if you've been waiting for a new Paper Mario game, I can't tell you not to try it. Just be aware there are things that might frustrate you. Next up, I played Pikmin 3 Deluxe, which is a sort of re-release with extra content of Pikmin 3 for the Wii U. familiar with Pikmin, you uh, command a team of up to 100 cute little alien creatures to solve puzzles and uncover items and win battles against alien creatures as you try and find your way off a planet you're stranded on. And this game is just really, really well made. It's got a ton of polish to it. It's good at making you think and challenging you without being overly difficult or too easy. It's just a really satisfying game to play. And though I did have the original version on the Wii U, for whatever reason I never finished it, I did finish this one though, and I loved it the whole way through. There's a lot of uh, extra content too that I haven't tried that I should try, but if you're into strategy games and kind of managing teams of uh, characters and all that, and solving puzzles with them, I would recommend it. Even if you haven't played the first two games, I think you can play this one easily without getting lost. And yeah, just a great game, Pikmin 3 Deluxe. I loved it. And next, I played the latest in the Yakuza series. And that is Yakuza Like a Dragon. So I recently finished, after a while, my playthrough of Yakuza 0, and I was in the mood for more Yakuza, but I wanted to change things up a little. And for the Yakuza series, that's what this game does. It has a new main character, new cast, and most importantly, a new gameplay system. It is a sort of semi-real-time turn-based RPG, JRPG, which is what I was talking about earlier. And when I said I wanted a JRPG that was more of my alley, this game fits that a lot better. I really like this game a lot. It's kind of like, imagine a small version of a GTA game, but instead of doing uh, American criminal stuff, you're uh, a member of the Yakuza, or working with 
with or challenging people in the Yakuza. Um, except the combat, instead of being an action game, is turn-based and plays kind of like a JRPG. And this game is kind of hard to explain concisely uh, beyond that, but it's just a really funny, entertaining game with a ton of content and entertaining events and mini-games and very uh, entertaining writing. It's just a big, complete package of a game. And I haven't finished it yet, but I'm maybe eight or nine hours into it, and I've loved what I've played so far. And yeah, if that sounds appealing to you, I would recommend it. I don't think you need to play any of the other games to really get this, but from what I've heard, I feel like maybe having played at least one of them might help with some of the novelty value of it. Either way, the re-release slash remaster of the original Quake that recently came out. And I played it on PC, and for whatever reason, despite being a fan of FPS games, and particularly old ones, I had never played the Quake games before. So this is my first time playing a Quake game. And I gotta say, it's great. It's a classic FPS for a reason. You run around shooting stuff, and it's got slightly better graphics than the original Doom games, and it's by the same developers. And it's really just more of the same, running around shooting monsters. That's all there is to it. If you like that, you'll like Quake. If you don't, I'm not sure it'll change your mind, but it's a great game if you're into that kind of thing. And uh, I will say this remaster is very good. It's very polished. The graphics look as modern as you can get without drastically changing the original models and style too much. It's just a great little FPS game. So yeah. consecutively 
and so do the enemies, and you just kind of repeatedly retry these super challenging little vignettes of a few enemies at a time until you proceed to the next one. And it is a very fun, thrilling, challenging game. It's very hard, but very satisfying to uh, succeed at. And if you like those types of games where you just keep doing one more try and restart instantly upon dying and just Keep going until you win, and you just feel really good when you do. You'll probably like Ghost Runner. Uh, I don't have much else to say about it. It's a pretty simple game, and uh, it's a pretty good time. Would recommend Ghost Runner for sure. And next, I played Post Void, which is also a very simple challenging, intense game, but it's what you get when you take simple, intense, and challenging and condense it as compactly as possible into a pure adrenaline shot into the eyeballs. It is a roguelike sort of FPS game that, if you're good at it, if you're good enough, you can finish in just a few minutes, but I've not finished it yet. This 
is not my favorite WarioWare game, but it is very fun. My favorite is still probably the original, to be honest, on the Game Boy. It was just so simple and exciting for its time. And while there's a lot of fun to be had here, I feel like the novelty value isn't quite as high. And the complexity of having the different characters with their movement schemes can sometimes feel a little frustrating with certain characters feeling
master solves a lot of those problems. And I can kind of see that because it's a very fun game that I have no real issue with. I haven't finished it yet. specific control system where you control the direction of your sword and all that. There's not much else I have to say about it, but if you like 3D Zelda, you'll probably like this one. That's really all I have to say. I look forward to finishing it at some point. And next I played a game called La Mulana, which if you're not familiar with it, the name probably means nothing. If you are familiar with it, you probably know it is notorious. It is a notoriously difficult and obtuse game on purpose that in some ways makes Dark Souls look simple and easy. It is a 2D Metroidvania type of game where you're exploring and solving but the combat is extremely unforgiving, the controls are very unwieldy, and the puzzles are extraordinarily difficult to solve, and sometimes require guessing, as far as I can tell. It's just one of those games that you play simply to challenge yourself to see if you can figure it out without a guide. Well, my friends, I cannot figure it out without a guide, Though I have not given in to using a guide yet, I've played a couple hours and not gotten very far, but I made a little bit of progress, and I'd like to go back to it at some point, but I do think I am in too deep over my head. Uh, that said, if you are a masochist and you are into that type of extreme, unfair, ridiculous challenge, you might purposely a very old school type of game, so you might not be a fan of controls, but it's an interesting game. It's a very uh, enticing concept to see if you can beat it, but I'm not sure I can. Next up, I got Spelunky, which shares many similarities with La Mulana, but I like it a lot more. Like La Mulana. exploration type of game. Uh, also with a similar theme of exploring ancient ruins, but this one is more of a roguelike action platformer with randomly generated levels and more fast-paced action feel to it. But like La Milana, it is very, very difficult. And I have not Sometimes maybe a little unfair, but the game seems to know this, and each run is so short that you can't really get too mad. That said, if you are someone who gets easily frustrated, I would not recommend La Mulana. I wouldn't recommend La Mulana, but I also wouldn't recommend Spelunky. It's got that sort of difficulty that simultaneously makes you want to try one more time, and also a very funny game at times, but sometimes the funniness gives way to frustration. Either way, a good old simple duty action platformer, very addictive and very difficult, but a good time. A good game, Spelunky. And next up, I played Metroid Dread, which is the long-awaited new Metroid. always been more of a fan of the Prime franchise and have been equally awaiting Metroid Prime 4 for almost five years now. I do like the other Metroid games as well, the 2D ones, and I gotta say, this is a very good one. I was pleasantly surprised with how good this is. I was a little skeptical of how it would be given that some of Nintendo's recent attempts at bringing back older franchises of 
just felt maybe a little phoned in or like they were missing the point. But this one does not feel that way. They've got a big, elaborate world to explore, lots of interesting and challenging enemies. It's a very difficult game at times, but in a satisfying way. There are tons of power-ups and just cool things to find and do in this game. And while it's not particularly long, I finished it in around 8 hours, I found it to be a very good time all the way through, and I have no real complaints about it. I guess I could say the difficulty spikes on occasion in a, in a way that feels maybe a little frustrating, but it's never too hard. It's one of those games where you just kind of have to learn the patterns of the enemies and bosses. And once you apply them, it feels very satisfying to win. So, yeah. If you like Metroid, you will like this game. Almost definitely. Though I will say there is one aspect of this that is a bit divisive. There are some stealth sections with uh, robots that chase you around. Um, and if they find you, it's an instant death most of the time, unless you're really lucky with a parry timing. Um, and to me, those parts felt a little tedious and annoying at times, but some people love them, so who am I to say if it's good or bad? Either way, regardless of whether you like those parts or not, up, I played Cruising Blast, which is a very cheesy, over-the-top arcade racing game that originally did come out as an arcade game and was recently ported to the Switch. It's a very simple game. You basically know what you're getting. An arcade game, nothing less, nothing more. But if you like racing cars at high speeds, through very uh, over-the-top set pieces with dinosaurs and aliens and just exploding things and collapsing buildings and giant ridiculous just stuff everywhere while you drift and try and collect power-ups or money really and boosting and all that that's what this game is it's nothing more nothing less it's got like I don't know 15, 20 tracks or whatever it is, and you just plan to have a simple good time. I'm sure it'd be good fun with friends, though I haven't played a multiplayer. It's not a game I'd recommend paying the full 40 bucks for, but I got it for, I think, 15 bucks on sale, and I'd say it was worth it. A good fun time when you just want to relax and drive a car through stupid set pieces. Silly little things. Or silly big things, really. Next up, I played Disco Elysium, The Final Cut, which is a game I've been very interested in for a very long time. I've heard great things about it, and I will tell you it is great, or great things are said about it for a reason. It is an excellent, excellent uh, narrative RPG game where you explore a world and talk to characters. some of the best writing I've ever seen in a video game. It's just really engaging and elaborate and super well written with really interesting characters. And just, it's just the kind of dialogue and writing that you would see in a good book, which is rare to see in a video game, so it's really interesting on that front. I've only played the first eight or nine hours so far since I got it recently, but I look forward to playing much more of it, and I just think it's really fun to kind of build out my character and make choices and assign points to the various stats, and really define who I want my character to be as I play this absolute disaster of a cop trying to solve a murder. 
game I've played recently is Murder House, which my last video was a playthrough of for Halloween. So you may already be intimately familiar with Murder House from that, but I will say this is a very simple, compact, retro-style horror game meant to feel like you're playing. VHS tape, and I gotta say, it's equal parts cheesy and terrifying. I found it to be a very, very scary game, despite being very cheesy at times, but that's clearly on purpose. It's clearly an homage to 80s B-movies, those kind of cheesy horror movies with the really over-the-top gore and silly special effects and terrible acting, but because you're playing them, a lot scarier than they otherwise would be. And this is just a game where you try and escape the home of a serial killer dressed as the Easter Bunny. And that's pretty much it. But it's a great time if you want a simple horror game with some cheesiness and some terrifying stuff in it. I would highly recommend Murder House. But not for the faint of heart. It's got some very dark, disturbing content in it. I won't go into, but there's some stuff in that game. Either way, great game, Murder House. And with that, those are the games I've played since the end of March. I do hope you enjoyed this video.